It's 5.03 p.m., so I'm going to, we have a lot on our agenda, so I'm going to call tonight's meeting to order at 5.03 p.m. Uh, and we have the first order of business is the uh, approval not required or ANR application for 39 Laurel Mountain Road uh, by Dan Hurwitt. Uh, so we have... We have received the required uh, copies of the plan. We have re received the application. Um, one thing, Dan, about the application that you submitted, mm -hmm. um, there is a field for address and number of the affected parcel, which was left blank. And I know the parcel doesn't have an address, but it does have a parcel number. So once we, we're gonna make sure we're, we're, we clarify what that parcel number is live tonight, and I'm gonna enter that on your behalf on the form. Okay, thank you. Um, I asked the surveyor about that, and he said that the top section was filled out and that it was an OR situation, not an no, AND. And there is an OR important. section about, um, how the owner's title to the land is derived. But oh. above that is a line that just says, address and number of the affected parcel. No ifs, ands, ors, buts, right? And that's currently blank. Um, but we'll, and it has no address, but it does have a parcel number. We'll, we'll... The address uh, probably on the assessors is probably something like north, east slash north of yeah, but wouldn't street. the parcel number be a precise Would. and accurate description? I think you should do. I think you should do both. Okay. Okay. So when I share my screen in a moment, we'll we'll do that. Um, and I'll say that again, we have not. I've been doing some research since this happened, Dan. And right now, I'm going to assume that we're we you will have no issue with this. Okay. But historically, uh, the planning board has received all of its plans for ANRs in a physical format of 24 by 36. And yours were delivered in a format of 24 by 18. Um, it, there's no clear guidance, I'm afraid, on, um, in fact, I can't say to you why everyone gives us ANRs and our plans in a 24 by 36 format, but they have been doing it. In fact, JD, mm. do you, I mean, I don't know why that's been happening, but it's always happened that way. However, the registry of deeds does not provide that kind of guidance. They just say a minimum of eight and a half by 11 by a maximum of 24 by 36. So you're definitely good there. Um, the Registry of Deeds says nothing about the scale, though our instructions do say our expected scale is one inch is 100 feet, and you gave us a better scale of one inch is 50 feet. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to argue with giving me higher resolution versus lower resolution. Um, so I'm inclined to just basically, we're going to do tonight's review. We're going to assume you're fine. And if and when you take these plans, I mean, they were prepared for you by a professional land surveyor who should know what he or she is doing. And if you run into a problem with the physical size of what you deliver to the um, to the registry of deeds, let's just say that's on you. <laughs> okay. Fair well, enough. We, right? But I, can, I, we can sign another Mylar if he has. Problems. Yes. Yes. We can absolutely sign another Mylar after tonight. It's not, there's not a big there's deal. There's no itch on your end, I don't think. Don't worry. Yeah. And we may want to clarify amongst ourselves what our own requirements are if we have them, because this is the first time I've ever seen something like this. And it, nobody at town offices seem to be able to really know what, what's required. Okay. Every, every set of plans that I get, they say right on there, don't scale off the drawings because even if you send a quarter scale to the printer, the printer is going to shrink it down or expand it or something, and it's not quite right. You got to go by the wet stamp of the land surveyor saying, "This is what this is. These are what these dimensions are." Okay. So if we get something that says it's forty feet in the print, we'll use a regular scale and find out exactly what it is. Okay. So, 
And there is no standard for prints. 18 by 36, 24 by 32, 36 by 48, they're all over the place. Okay. So right. if it has a wet stamp, I would be inclined to say that's good enough for me. Okay. And all I can say is I haven't been around that long. I've only seen so many of these, but it, I always got 24 by 36 before. So Dan just gave me a little pleasant surprise and expanded my horizon. So thank you, Dan. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to share the digital copy of uh, the plan that you, you provided to us. Mm -hmm. I'm going to share this and I'm going to just have you, well, first of all, well, um, we're going to talk about this. I want to hear from you what's going on with this parcel. Mm -hmm. And um, I suppose a little bit about what's motivating it. But um, yeah, I'd like to hear from you first. So please proceed. Sure. Um, so thank you, everyone, for taking the time to review this today. I really appreciate it. And sorry for all the inconsistencies. This is the first time I've ever gone through this process. So um do my best to keep it all straight, but I appreciate your flexibility. You save you money by printing on a smaller paper. <laughs> Good for the uh, environment, Dan. Exactly. Um, sure. So, so um, my fiance and I just moved in uh, to Thirty Nine Laurel Mountain Road. Um, as you know, it's divided. We have a, the how main house is across the street from these barns, um, and there was originally about two point one two acres. Uh, across the street, my fiance and I are intending to put a big garden in over there. Um, and I was approached by Rob and his wife, uh, Chris, uh, who expressed interest in purchasing a portion, um, parcel B on this map. Um, that is a hillside. Um, it doesn't really factor into my partner and my plans to put a garden in. Um, and so we were more than happy to sell it to them as May, you know, mainly our motivator is to defray some of the costs of a purchase of a home. Um, that's all. I, <laughs> that's that's fairly straightforward. That's all I really have to say about it. Neither of us are planning to build. As you see, we, you know, these are non-building lots. Um, that's not our intention. Our intention is to be here for a long time and to have a nice garden and a small orchard over there. Um, so I am curious why those, why the parcel prior to subdivision is considered not a building lot uh prior to subdivision i think it is yes okay yeah. i understand yeah. that but i just and wanted so, to clarify that our intent is never to build as you can see by the, the non-building lot designation after the split that's actually irrelevant to our decision okay. it is irrelevant to the decision um, why I, why are we why does he want to make the present site not a building lot, not conform to the minimum lot size? Uh, and, and this is my question again. This mm -hmm. is not Judy's point is accurate that why they want to do the subdivision just, okay. is not of concern to the okay. decision of the ANR. Okay. Um, I'm happy to answer the question. But, but I did because Dan is new to Waitley, and I was looking at this and thinking, oh. The, out, the effect of this, given that these are parcels in West Waitley that are not on town water, at present, prior to subdivision and conveyance of parcel B to um, the Libons, or, or Rob, yeah, um, prior to subdivision and conveyance, the Libon lot is non-conforming. It is too small. Uh, for a lot in AR1 that's not on public water. It's approximately an acre in size. And the, the minimum lot size is 60,000 square feet. So by um, purchasing parcel B from you, the benefit to, as I understand it, and I'm doing a little bit of inference here, um, Robert Libon converts his non-conforming lot which also doesn't have sufficient frontage on a public way. It right now only has 150 feet of frontage on a public way. By adding parcel B to the existing Libon lot, it becomes a, a, a 
conforming lot, you might say, right? Now it has enough frontage and enough acreage for anything would that they may do want to do. They would have to do another ANR to do that. They would to combine the parcels. So they would have to do an ANR to combine the parcels. Mm -hmm. So, and so that may be coming up for us, right? Unless they simply want to <laughs> expand their property and have an, an adjacent lot. But at the moment, the Libons would now acquire a small lot that they couldn't do any building with. And that presumably they understand that. But my point to you, Dan, was you are knowledgeable, you know, with, with full knowledge going by selling parcel B, you're going to take a conforming lot, buildable conforming lot, and reduce it to a lot that's too small, although it has enough frontage. And so it would no longer without ZBA approval, a dwelling or other kinds of structures could not be placed on that lot. And that also affects how it might be sold off in the future. Yes. Not relevant to the planning board's decision, but I'm simply pointing that out. Grant, why, why, um, or why would we allow breaking it up to create a, his present place a non-conforming lot? Why wouldn't they move the line to keep it 60,000 so at least his present place is conforming to what we need. How can we, well, obviously there's more, there's plenty of square footage there, but if you only need 60,000, I I think we should. We don't have 60, any 000. control over what they want to do. I think right. we also, like, we don't live on that? that side of the street. Yeah. That's nobody lives there right now. But we're creating a non-conforming lot from what certainly could be a conforming lot. So moving a lot a couple of feet makes it a conforming lot. It keeps it more valuable to you. Well, yeah. no, it just makes it more. I think that's if if you are in the it town, would be can, more can, valuable as a conforming lot. Could I take my house and say I don't want to pay taxes on fifty feet of it, so I'm just going to sell it to my neighbor, and make my my lot smaller. I don't. So we, I'm just saying, meet the minimum. Okay. okay. All right. So hold on, because we don't want this to take all night. Okay. So um, we're just putting this out there for you, Dan. Um, this is not relevant to our decision. We can go ahead and, and if you wish us to proceed with this, and I suppose if we approve this, you still don't have to file this if you have second thoughts. That's, but I just want the, you to understand. That's the relevant thing. If he has second thoughts, he doesn't take it to the registry and he brings a different plan back to us. Right. Period. Okay. But I think JD has a valid point that why would you take a conforming lot in the ag res district, a valuable lot in Waitley, and convert it into convert it into something that neither you nor any future owner of that lot could build on without other, you know. Well, they may not be able to do anything unless they could get a parcel of it back, right? So we have minimum requirements for lot um, lot size in the AR1 district for lots that are not on public water. So if you move that line, the boundary line a little bit on a plan like this to keep parcel A to be 60,000 square feet instead of reducing it to 54,000 and change, you would maintain the lot as a buildable lot for the future versus taking that entirely off the table and, or making it extremely complicated. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I guess- we have, say, we have no knowledge of the negotiations that went into this. Right, that's right. The, the monetary transactions, anything. We we are we have given him our advice or our thoughts. Yes. Period. And that's that's all we can do. Correct. So I'm prepared then to get into the substance of the ANR review so we can make a decision about what we have before us, irrespective of what we've just discussed. Shall we proceed, Dan? 
Yes, please. Okay, very good. All right. So um, in looking over the relevant portions of the Subdivision Control Act that guide our decision here, um, frontage is a is a, a consideration. And it looks no, like it's not. no, I don't I just mean that it's one of the things that we look at, but there seem to be no issues with frontage here. There seem to be no issues okay. with okay. public utilities and there are no issues. Not, Go ahead. Not, sorry, it's a frontage. I'm sorry, Judy, could you say that one more time? I, I was assuming you were still talking about the size of the frontage as opposed to the fact of its existence. I was correcting myself. No, no, I was simply, I think we've moved on to the ANR review. And I was just, at least for my own benefit, following along in the relevant Subdivision Control Act um, requirements about how we review these kinds of ANR proposals. And it, and my overall sense is that um, this plan meets the requirements of an approval not required. That there's adequate frontage on public ways. There are no grades on roads greater than 10%. There's adequate access. So I don't, I have not. I move we, I move we uh, approve it. Okay. I'll second that. Okay. The motion to approve this as an ANR has been made by Judy and seconded by Sarah. Uh, we'll do a vote. Uh, well, we, after a motion is made and seconded, any discussion? JD. Yeah, there's no dwelling on there, so. They can carve it up, but by right, he could do what he wants to do, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah. Seems cut and dried. Okay. Very good. If there's no more discussion, we'll move to a vote. Um, Sarah? Aye. Is aye. JD? Aye. Judy? Aye. And Brandt is also aye. So it is approved unanimously. Okay. Um, so let me just do one more thing. Uh, let me just back to my original point about uh, oh yeah, what I want to do is share this. Give me one more screen share. So I'm sharing the online assessors map, and I'm highlighting the entire parcel brought pre-subdivision. Pre so it's identified as parcel 10-0-05. You can see where my mouse is, Dan. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the parcel being subdivided. And the property address is just shown here as, um, I think uh, I clicked on the wrong thing. So what Judy has recommended is that I will modify your I will just um, update your Form A application to reflect that it is parcel 10.10-0.05, and that's the property address. I'll get this signed and dated to you. Now, I'm going to be out of town, effective early tomorrow. Okay. So there's a little going to be a delay in getting this paperwork done. We have to sign the Mylar and all of that. So it's probably going to be late next week or latest early the week after next before we've completed all of these documents for you. Okay. Okay. That's so, when it will be. There's <laughs> not much we can do about that. And um, I mean, I will, I will of course be able to give you a sign scan copy of this electronically, but I can't deal with the maps and all of that. And okay. also um, a, essential planning board stamp used for ANRs has gone missing and a new one is being ordered. So that's adding a little bit of a delay. Okay. Uh, but not much, thanks to. So I think we're done. Congratulations. Um, 
I'm going to stop sharing. I think so we're let us ready. know when the MLR is there to be signed. We will be in touch, Dan, as soon as the MILAR is signed and ready for you to pick up at town offices. Okay, wonderful. And like I said, late next week or early the following. Sounds good to me. Okay, thank you and good evening. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Okay, our next order of business. This is our floodplain bylaw update. And so Sylvie gets the stage here. Um, I want I I don't think I need to spend time tonight giving going over the background for everybody. So I'll just give you the floor, Sylvie, to let us know where things stand. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Um, happy New Year. Um, I don't have a scintillating update for you. Um, but I have reached out to Scott so that we can uh, move this along to clarify um, what he would need in order to be comfortable having the CONCOM in a position to participate in the process of administering the, the bylaw. Um, so I think that uh, we all agree that we we do want CONCOM to be involved. Um, I, I think that would be helpful. Um, I think it'll be a process that I would be involved in, Brian would be involved, uh, Concom would um, assist us with that review that we'd have to do for any applications, and um, we'd also be working with the building inspector. Um, and I think um, once I know um, more about uh, what uh, clarification Scott might need um, and what state guidance that might require, then I will be able to uh, then get that clarification from from uh, a state contact. It's just that um, I haven't as of yet, when we attended that um, training, I wasn't aware of what concerns Scott might have. Um, so I, I um, wasn't um, observing from that perspective, but um, I think after talking to him, that would be helpful. Brian wants to meet with him. Um, and I think that Brian is of the opinion that um, most likely, um, it'll be difficult to capture all of the exemptions that we have, um, you know, as these types of applications come in throughout the years. Um, so it might just be that this has to be sort of a, uh, an evolving um, bylaw that will be um, amended as necessary when we discover that there are certain things that we need to account for. Um, so I think that he feels perhaps that we're going to need to um, try and get a, a working bylaw in place once we confer with Scott. Um, and then we may have to update that bylaw as necessary as we go through the process with um, people who might submit uh, applications. Um, so if you have any um, further guidance for me or any questions that you want me to um, try and figure out, um, please let me know. Sylvie, I would not rely on any guidance from the state with regard to Scott's issues. We've been trying for many years okay. to get that. They literally don't understand the agricultural exemption and okay. how it how it plays. And that's that's a major part of what Scott's concerns are. Mm -hmm. The other is that he is used to being uh, to enforcing state regulations that are written regulations. I right. think he's somewhat uncomfortable about authority that's just devolved to, to the CONCOM via a bylaw. It's not something he's he's familiar with. And what? I can't, I mean, I don't understand it. We operate, the ZBA and the planning board operate on the basis of bylaws all the time, but he has always looked to state regulations. And so he asks a lot of questions about authority. Mm. And from where, where does the authority come from? And just, I'm trying to give you perspective here. Mm. Um, and you'll have to you'll have to talk that through with him so he's comfortable. Yeah. Well, I think that's fine. I mean, I, uh, if, if, I mean, I'm not sure um, what recourse we have other than to um, 
try and get uh, uh, an adequate question to, you know, the the worry about where the authority is coming from. And it, I'm not sure where- You will have to convince him that the bylaw gives authority. Okay. All right. Brian may be able to put it more clearly. Mm -hmm. um, okay. The situation is a problem between the floodplain bylaw, which is one state regulation, and the 40A agricultural exemption, which is another. Mm -hmm. And there's no clear bridge between the two. And he knows a lot about how the how the agricultural exemption has operated with regard to other regulations. It's not, I'm, I'm putting words in his mouth. Let him explain. He's a professor. He can do a better job than I, but. but okay, um, um, I, I but, feel but, those, that there, if we have like, um, if we have a problem fundamentally between, uh, you know, uh, we w we want Scott and the concom to be involved, but Scott's not comfortable with where the authority is coming from, just from the bylaw. I mean, there should be someone who would be willing from the state level to help us to get those answers. I would think, but um, there should be. But I guarantee you, there's nobody on the <laughs> floodplain bylaw side, and I don't know if anybody at MDAR can and. I don't think any other town. We have a problem that Scott is so expert mm -hmm. that he knows more than almost anybody. No <laughs> other town is approaching this in the kind of detail that he is. That's and he good. has expertise that's far greater than Joy Devereaux and, and the other woman. Mm -hmm. And um It's, you know, if you write the book, then you know a lot. I, but, you know, if, if it were easy, we would have been there by now. So this is going to take a while. You're just going to have to make Scott comfortable. And Brian, you, you three sitting down can probably do a better job than the whole group of us, which is why mm -hmm. I think you're you're stuck with this. If, I, if, it would. if, if any of us can help, we'd be happy to. But I think... A, small group would be much better all right yeah that's fine so um i will plan uh brian and i are are you know whenever scott has availability we're, we'll plan to to sit down with him specifically about this and try and find some answers so that we can move it forward for your benefit you. one of the reasons that the concom is highlighted in the review is that almost all of the procedures and the rules are Essentially, there's ones they review now for wetlands and and their other right. regulations. So, so sure. it, it would be duplicative to have somebody else do do it. Yeah, I agree. And it would certainly be beyond the scope of the planning board to take that on. I mean, I think from my standpoint, I just wanted to just make it clear that at this point, the planning board has taken this needed bylaw as far as we can until some of these administrative details are sorted out. And we're not able to handle these negotiations and come to an agreement, especially since the floodplain administrator designated by this new bylaw is you, Sylvie. Yeah, right? I had thought it was uh, Brian um, prior to getting your message, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's fine. <laughs> that's right. And, and also it's important that this is a, multi-page complicated bylaw mm -hmm. that introduces a new kind of regulatory process related to protecting you know, against flooding and flood related damage uh, even in our public hearing of which there was one or was there two judy we did just one public hearing on this am i right i think so it became so evident we couldn't answer any of the questions we didn't Right. Yeah, that that when this when because we need to do this, it eventually comes before voters at town meeting. It's mm -hmm. going to need um, considerable support uh, because many people will come to town meeting without having 
been in the sausage factory. Um, and so having town leadership and really being prepared to explain and defend the need for this new bylaw at town meeting will be important. So that's again, joint work between right. the planning board, conservation commission and town leadership. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. Anything else on the floodplain bylaw? Hearing none, we'll move on to the next topic, which is- Brent, this... Maybe it would be a courtesy to ask Anne if she's here for a special issue or not. I did, we've already had that conversation. I'm sorry. Anne is here yep. for this very next item. Yes, oh, okay. although I might be okay. interested in the aquifer one too, but- <laughs> Well, we'd love to have you involved <laughs> in our aquifer discussion too. Um, this is, these meetings are always so fun that if you want to stay on, <laughs> you'd be more than welcome to. Okay, so we're going to move on to this next topic. I'm, Judy, I'm going to share my screen showing your draft letter to the select board and yield the floor to you to take, dis discuss what you, this letter and what you think we should do. And there will be time, oh, Anne, for a comment. Thanks. I'm going to assume that you've all read the letter. Um, the background here is that this bill has been filed in the legislature. Um, it would restore the, the authority that I think we all, everybody in planning and zoning in the state assumed that communities had um, that essentially was undone by a court case in 20, 2022. Um, prior to that, we had assumed that the exclusion from zoning that is in the Massachusetts bylaws applied only to small residential type units, which in fact were the were the ones, the variety of solar facilities that existed when the, when the exclusion was, was enacted. Um, so solid was this belief that the, that the Department of Energy actually drafted a model bylaw for large ground mounted solar facilities that we based our bylaw on or used as a foundation for it. Um, which exempted small facilities and from, from review. The court found that it applied to all facilities and it has now, the Attorney General's office is extending this exclusion to standalone battery storage facilities. And they're being very, um, I don't know whether you want to say conservative or aggressive in their interpretation of, of the exclusion and have rejected a lot of bylaws, newly proposed bylaws for solar facilities and battery storage. I am quite personally quite concerned about exposure in Waitley part of our bylaw structure is different than that in a lot of towns. We, we allow solar in most, most areas in town and we have counted on regulating it through um, special permit site, site plan review and maximum size on facilities. My guess is the maximum size is probably no longer tenable. I don't know for sure, obviously. Um, we don't have any provisions for standalone battery storage. We have always assumed that if it's not specifically listed as a use, it wasn't allowed. I don't think that's tenable anymore for this, for this particular use. Large scale solar facilities are the only industrial use that local communities don't have siting control over. And so 
I am recommending that the board request the select board to to uh, write our legislators in support of, of the bill that would restore local control. And this is the draft letter that I propose. Period. Thank you, Judy. I have a clarification question. I recall when you brought this recommendation to the board initially, you suggested two letters. One that the planning board would send on our own to state legislators, and two, essentially this letter. And I want to find out if you've rethought that and your recommendation is that the planning board via this letter before us now recommend the select board take an action and that's it. Or you still feel like we should also write our own letter independently of any select board letter. I, I'm recommending the former. It, I, the more I thought about it, the more it seemed rather self-serving for the planning board to write a letter saying, please, please give us more control. Because we would just be talking for ourselves, whereas the select board is in a position to have overview over all of the town's interests, including the energy committee and 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 the Ag Committee and, and others. So I think we have a role in providing input, but I don't think a letter from us would have the kind of weight that the select board one would. I would encourage everybody to write on their own, and I intend to do that as, okay. as a citizen, but that's different. And I have another question. I will give the floor in a moment to Anne, so get ready, Anne. Um, in preparing and in preparing and sending such a letter from the planning board to the select board, would you want this letter to be CC to any other boards and commissions within the town of Wait? Is this, would, in other words, is this just from us to the planning board, is or is it from us to the planning board? With CC to certain others that might might care and want to know we're having this conversation. To the select board, you mean? I I think I think adding CCs is fine. I would include the Ag Commission. And um, specifically the Ag Commission and the open the ZBA. Um. I think I kind of agree with Judy's position, but I feel that the water department and the fire department would have a lot of input on this mm -hmm. because with the, where the municipal water system is for potential fire, like yeah, you have a water source to put them out. So that's something to be considered as well. Yep. So public and, safety, and uh, public safety, especially the fire chief and the water commissioner. So like if something's on West Waitley where there's no fire hydrants, that makes a big difference versus something yeah. on stay down by like with Yankee Candles, where there's a 16 inch water main, where there's lots of water. Available. Not sure. I'm not sure we use water. Well, I'm not entirely sure what we used to put these out, but yeah, I think certainly I know John Hannum used to feel that the town didn't have the training any of to to deal with the safety precautions here. And, and the technology changes every day as well. Yeah. So no, excellent suggestion. Okay. So, and I'd like to give Sarah a chance to speak as a board member before I open the floor to the public, which is right now you have. Sarah? Yes, we really need to protect our water and we don't, as the size of our town, we don't have the resources for combating public safety issues. It'd be nice to have this control for to cite it where it's best in our town. Yes, I support Judy's letter also. Anne. Thank you. Um, I did only find out about this a few hours ago, so I don't have a prepared statement, but I have some experience in this because <laughs> four years ago I faced this issue when a large solar field was proposed to abut my property, and they were also talking about putting on battery storage in the area. 
And that was pretty much in the center of town <laughs> or close to the center of town. So I did a lot of research and it, I'll touch on a few of the things you're talking about, maybe starting with the water issue because <laughs> that's on my mind here. Um, I had talked to John Hannum at that point about this issue. He was very concerned there was is not enough water in Waitley to combat these. So solar, um, the batter, batteries are the uh, lithium ion. Some water is used, but uh, there were fires. There've been multiple fires in different locations in the country and hours and hours of water is used. And he, he felt there wasn't enough water in the white, the water supply to even combat a fire. Mm -hmm. um, you, there were also chemical uses and I can't get into all of that, but he did also feel that we don't have, um, most fire departments don't have the staff or the education or the equipment because you basically need, I don't know what to call it, except full hazmat suits, but um, they're very dangerous fires and they reignite over time and it takes hours and hours to put them out. Um, and it's a really dangerous, it's a real health and safety issue for Waitley. Um, and it is not just the fire, it's the toxic gases that are emitted from a solar uh, battery fire like this. Um, and that's why I think I've seen some information about that New York State is pulling together um, a fire department, you know, fire issues on this particular situation because they've had some of these battery fires and the fire departments are extremely concerned about how to how to fight them. We have a volunteer fire department, basically, right? We're not equipped to deal with something like this. Um, there, there's also an issue with toxicity um, to the water supply. A lot of us have private wells. And so it's not just the air, it's these um, toxic chemicals getting into the water supply, um, into the air and those kinds of things. Um, there are, can be explosions and if you've had put battery storage, you know, in the center of town, potentially burn the town down. I mean, it's that is um, not an exaggeration because there've been huge fires in Japan, huge fires in Arizona, um, and that's the situation. It's a dangerous thing to have battery storage. There are some other issues with just large solar arrays, um, but I don't know that I need to get into that. There's similar types of issues. Um, so it's, those are some of my comments. It's a it's a serious issue, and I think the town should have control. So I very much support what Judy's letter says, and um, the town needs to control us. Very good, and thank you for your perspective. So you're um, endorsing Judy's recommendation that Correct. we, the planning board, send this letter, um, and with appropriate CCs to yes. other others in town. If I might also add, the Conservation Commission certainly should be involved. They were involved um, yep. before. Thank you. Again, thank you. Um, what I'd like to also share with everyone here tonight is that independently, and I don't know, you know, obviously word somehow found its way out. Sometimes I'm amazed by people looking at our agenda or finding out about what we're doing, which they should, I'm glad it's it's happening. Um, but I received three unsolicited, or the planning board received three unsolicited emails related to this topic. Uh, one, and maybe I'll just pause for a second here and ask Judy's experience guidance here. Um, I can simply, without, sharing identities of writers, give the sort of the gist. How do you recommend or what's the pra best practice, Judy, for when we have a discussion about unsolicited letters, what they've said, who's said it, are these put into the public record? How, how do we handle it? Did these go to you personally or to planning? It? They were what? sent to the planning board email inbox. Then I would assume that they're available for the public record. Okay. Okay, very good. Um, so I will make sure to um, turn these into PDFs, share them with Mary, and I and I don't know whether they go to the town clerk. They stay in our records, but we'll keep records of the. No, they're just they're just part of our files. Yeah. Um, you can just print them as as the emails and. Okay. Send them to Mary. 
So I would just summarize that both that all three of Neil Abraham, Donna Wiley, and Margaret Christie all independently wrote emails to the planning board in support of this general recommendation, all speaking to different, you know, with points very um, compatible and uh, with what Judy wrote, with what Anne expressed, that endorsing the idea that the planning board encouraged the select board to support this particular act in the legislature. So besides Anne, there are others in our other of our neighbors who are paying attention to this topic and writing to us to move forward with this. So with that, Graham, um, could you could you please repeat the names? I got two of the missing absolutely. one. So the first letter writer is Neil N E A L Abraham. The second letter writer is Donna Wiley W I L E Y. The third letter writer is Margaret Christie, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-E. Thank you. I don't think I need to screen share or read the letters into the record, but basically summarize them all as encouraging the planning board to send this letter. So with that, uh, Judy, you might want to consider making a motion taking into consideration the feedback about CCs? Well, I think I would like to move, okay, I would move that the planning boards go on record as supporting the bills and urging the select board to, to support them as well on behalf of the town of Waitley and communicate the same to our representatives. You can shorten that, Mary. However you want. Thank you. That's, I think that's a perfectly adequate motion. And we will convey it in writing. And I saw Sarah's hand go as a second. I assume that's a second, just not a high. It's a second. That's, my, that's good. Uh, so the motion's made and seconded. Any other discussion or debate? Um. I think I the think, letter ought to, I'm sorry, Jaden. Okay, so I 100% support where Judy's coming from. I think we're gonna have a lot of, not so pushback from our state government on this because of our electrified future that they're gonna be pushing for this. And it's not, I see it in my building trades every day and talking with inspectors and my trainings and stuff. The battery storage issue, this is on a large scale, but on the small scale, people are putting in solar panels on their house with battery storage, even electric cars and even uh, the knockoff batteries for electric drills. Where they're telling us don't put car chargers in garages because cars catch on fire and um, then they burn the houses down and you can't put the fires out because it's a chemical fire. Um, and people adding these power walls to their house for their solar panels. And, and I have solar panels in my house. I, I love them. But there's going to be a defining line where so many people have these storage devices at their houses to power them. Um, are we going to like say, okay, no big ones, but we're allowing small storage devices all over town? I just think that's coming. Yeah, it, it is coming things every, every day. And I'll point out, I have solar storage in the basement in my house. Yep. But if it catches on fire, there's no way to put it out. It's a it's a chemical fire. Hopefully the technology comes around that we find a, find something yeah. that extinguishes them. Yeah, I think your point is very valid, JD. Um, that's um, things that are in houses or on buildings aren't a zoning issue. They're kind of outside our purview. Yeah, yeah. And they're not they're not affected by this. But I, like our energy exclusion. committee and the state government is going to be pushing for storage because once the sun goes down i understand and yeah and i think we're going to be storage in responsible places is fine yeah um, there's several I, don't know times that, that, I don't know what that responsible place what, but I, what it would be I agree nice with your is position to be able to have, regulate it. have oversight yeah absolutely i agree yeah i think the point of this letter is to make the argument and request to our state legislature that they not unreasonably deny municipalities like ours 
from appropriately regulating the placement of solar facilities and battery storage. We in Waitley will have an issue dealing with battery storage because our current solar bylaw is silent and inadequate on that subject. And one of the three letter writers specifically spoke to his concerns on that very topic. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's nothing wrong with taking a position and advocating for it, uh, which That's is great. what this letter does. Um, yep. And then it goes into the sausage factory that's our state legislature. Okay, all right. So I think we've had enough discussion and debate. The motion's been made and seconded. So we'll simply vote whether to um, convey, you know, vote on Judy's motion. So uh, roll call before you Before you yep. vote, I think I ought, the letter ought to be amended to address the safety issues that were raised tonight. So you're asking to table this no, so that you I'll can vote it, vote it conditional on those, approve it with the understanding that that some additional input would be made about problems of safety and weight lift regarding battery storage. Okay, so I think if you're so you're modifying the motion. So um, no, hey, Brent, we, is we it, didn't. Is it we fair? didn't get to what the le the motion said to send a letter. It did not say to send this letter. Okay. We're we're giving our opinion on what we think should happen. So if we we can't speak for the fire chief and public safety, but I'm sure the energy committee has an opinion too. So if we addition yeah. is, we're saying this is our opinion. Okay. All right. Leave it as is. It's, it's not. It's not fair to pick on the energy committee by including. Good. Gallery. Good point. Good point. Yeah. So, how are we leaving the mo? What exactly are we voting on? Sending the letter. As is. Yep. Okay. As is. Yeah. So we're voting on sending the letter in its current form, as we see here. You know, of course, with the you know putting it on letterhead and blah blah blah. Yep. All right, so is everybody clear on what we're voting on? Yes. No, and there's no, <clears throat> there are going to be no major changes to this letter between now and it's being conveyed to the select board. And it will be CC'd to all the affected boards, and it'll be CC'd to AGCOM, ZBA, Conservation Commission, Energy, Water, Fire, Police. Board of Health, you know, basically everyone, and I, did I say energy? Pretty much anyone who has a stake in this, which is pretty much everybody except probably the Cemetery Commission. Yeah, we have to let everyone from all sides have an input on it. Yeah. And then for citizens like Anne, track this at the select board level, because when this comes up for discussion at the select board, voices like yours need to be heard there. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So the motion has been made. Sarah seconded it. So we're now doing the vote. And I'll just go top to bottom on my screen, starting with you, Sarah. Yes. Judy. Yes. JD. Yes. And Brandt is yes. So we the motion passes and we will convey that letter. Judy, I'll work with you over the coming few days to get into the right format. It should come from the planning board chair, right? I mean, it could come from a, a member, but we'll put it on planning board letterhead. Well, I would, I would suggest that you sign it um, for the planning board. Yes. Just with the, underneath for the planning board. We'll do. Okay. Just on the side. Thank you, Judy. You did a good job on that. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so what I'm going to do next, um, especially since Anne indicated interest in the aquifer overlay district conversation, I'm going to propose we swap these two agenda items and take up the aquifer overlay district discussion first and then get to um, the zoning bylaw amendments related to affordable housing after that. Thank you. Okay, is that okay with you, Judy? 
good. All right. All right. So once again, um, and did I give me one second to make sure I have this ready to screen share? Of course, that was the one thing. Not the full protection district. It goes revisions. Okay. I'm just about ready to do my screen share. Hold on a second. All right. So what we're gonna I'm going to screen share first is, uh, I guess what I'll do, I'll do one more thing here. So I'll be a little bit more, I'll go into a little bit more background and detail. For Anne's benefit. Okay. So this, this is what I'm going to screen share first. All right. Thanks for bearing with me with my little screen sharing business. Let me show. So just for Anne and everyone's benefit, this is the current. Um, effective official zoning map for the town of Waitley approved last May. Um, so this is the one that's currently in effect. Uh, and I'll just point out that there were these aquifer protection zones defined in our bylaw, zones one, two, and three. The current map doesn't depict the zone ones, which are immediately around the wellheads. Uh, the current map, which you're seeing here, shows zone two, which is the immediate areas over roughly needed to protect water draining right into the aquifers. And zone threes are upland areas that feed water into the zone twos, sort of giving you the the general intuition. This is the current approved map. And if you can see my mouse, there's a zone two depicted, um, if you see where my mouse is a little bit um, to the south of Haydenville Road and the zone three, a little to the north of Haydenville Road. These two zones were added years back to protect the Waitley Water District when it became a public water supply, serving mostly the center of town. The Waitley Water District has since been abandoned. Uh, and we made some changes last May to our Aquifer Protection Overlay District bylaw to, to basically reflect the fact that some protections related to the abandoned water district public water supply were no longer needed. However, the water by the aquifer protection district bylaw works in concert with this zoning map. The zoning map defines the boundaries of the protection zones. So you need the bylaw plus the map to know what land is within the protected districts, all right? And we had a discussion leading up to the May 2023 annual town meeting about the two zones I just pointed out that were on the map there to protect the water district, which had been abandoned. And the question at the time was, gee, do we remove those zones? What do we do? And we couldn't resolve that question in time for annual meeting. So we took a conservative course of leaving the zones two and three that were there for the water district, we left those unchanged. And so they're still in effect and arguably protecting and restricting land use of lands that no longer need to be so restricted because the related public water supply is no longer in use. And we've had all the discussions that public water supply is, the district supply is never coming back. It's not a backup. You know, there's no reason to be cautious and say, well, we ought to just keep protecting all of that land because what if we need to 
retap those wells. Apparently that's just not going to happen, all right? So we had a conversation, multiple conversations with the water department and ultimately they gave us recommendations on revising the zones two and three needed to protect the water department's supply, right? So we had, we originally had just the water department, then the water district was added along with the protection districts. Then the water district has been abandoned and now we're back to just the water department. So what we are doing and discussing are A, revising the map, changing this map that I'm currently showing you. And I'm gonna show you the proposed new map and making corresponding changes to the wording of the bylaw to bring the two, bring the bylaw and the new map in alignment, right? What I'm gonna do now is I'm going to switch. This map is downloadable from the Waitley Public website. All right, so you, anybody can look at this at their leisure. It's off from the planning board's page. I think it's even, yeah, I think that's easiest way to find it. Now I'm going to shift my screen share to the proposed new map. So let me make a few, now I'm, hopefully you're seeing this new map. Let me make a few comments about this new map. I've been working with a GIS specialist at the Franklin Regional Council of Governments to prepare this proposed new map. Uh, and we're not, tonight, all we're doing is discussing the map. There would have to be a public hearing and ultimately a vote at town meeting for a map like this to become the new official Wheatley zoning map. So right now we're having a discussion about this map and its, its contents, its quality, what's depicted and so forth, okay? And then I'll also bring up the proposed bylaw wording changes. So one change that's been made since the official map is we're now depicting the, the zone ones. These are, you see these red dots and the red circles. So now we're depicting, um, and this was apparently from our GIS specialist, he obtained um, wellhead information from the Mass Department of Environmental Protection. Some of the wellheads, the zone ones are shown that are not entirely within the borders of Waitley. You'll see just across the border in Hatfield, there's a zone one. And I don't know if that is a wellhead associated with the water department or not. You'll notice that up in West Waitley, there appear to be, I think the reservoirs have red dots because the reservoirs themselves are public water supplies, though not for Waitley, for Northampton. I believe that up near Poplar Hill Road, there's a zone one depicted that again is not part of the water department. So I've been discussing with our GIS specialist simply removing these extraneous um, water supply marks and, and just leaving the water supplies that are within the, within the <clears throat> limits of Waitley, the borders of Waitley, and that relate to our water department. I think that's one item of feedback, um, one, one deficiency that I see in this current map. But you'll notice that what I want to point out is that the zone three here in this proposed new map has been expanded into a portion of what was the zone two for the water district. So there's an area sort of the northwest corner of this new zone three. That area served both the water district as well as the water department. So there is a portion of this zone three for the department's water supply that was actually directly over the water district 
and was thus the water district zone two. So we've eliminated the zone two for the district and increased the span of the zone three for the department to include that overlapping region. And, and, the, and this was confirmed for me by Nicholas Jones, who was the commissioner of the water district, that in fact, there was this overlapping area. The zone two depicted here is unchanged. This was the original zone two for the water department. So I just wanna see if there are any comments or questions about this map above and beyond what I mentioned about the depiction of the zone ones. Sarah. Zone ones, one of our wells, I'm pretty positive, is in Hatfield. Okay. So that should stay on personally. Okay. I do think we can I, probably get rid of Deerfield and Northampton's water supplies. Actually, I I would disagree with that. Okay. Based solely on the fact that this is a zoning map, not a, a water system map. And our zoning doesn't have any authority in Hatfield. Thank you, Judy. Um, I agree with, it's nice to know it's there. Maybe it would be nice to, you know, learning about all these water sources, it would be great to have a map separate from zoning that, that goes into this, but I don't think it has a role in the, in the zoning map. So you're endorsing A, removing the zone ones that are, a, that are not within the borders of Waitley, number one, and two, that are not associated with the water department, public water supply. I would, re I would make it broader than that. I would remove anything that doesn't relate to Waitley zoning. So that would be all of the zoning districts outside Waitley. And as you said, the demarcations of the, of the other wellheads and water supplies. Oh, I see. So eliminate the portion of zone two that extends into Hatfield. And the one in Deerfield. And the one in Deerfield. Correct. Okay. That's good feedback. I mean, this is a Waitley zoning map, period. Yeah. Okay. Um, JD. I have quite a few things to say about this. <clears throat> so you asked me at the last meeting to reach out to various people about affordable housing and so forth. And I had a wonderful conversation with the building commissioner in East Hampton today about our overlay district and aquifer protection. Of course, we want to protect that. But playing devil's advocate, how does requiring a 250 foot frontage make the aquifer safer than a 200 foot? Is it more of a not in my backyard zoning? And she cautioned me, she said a lot of small towns like Waitley, Deerfield, Hadfield, they're going by science that is not relevant. They're going by science from the 1980s and not current up-to-date stuff. Like a city like Amherst or Northampton who has active full-time people, they know exactly what's going on. But she said in small towns, you're making decisions on, on aquifer districts based on science is 40 years old. So I don't know how accurate all of this is, but in terms of creating more housing and creating more opportunities and, and adding a little addition on your house, is that not going to be allowed in the affluent center section of Waitley because of this? And 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 we building houses. My houses don't pollute. There's no. We don't use oil in houses anymore. The building code doesn't really allow it. Our, we have Title Five compliant septic systems that don't allow any runoff. They're very very carefully regulated by the state. How are we polluting by adding a small addition or putting a small house in? in these areas and i'm much more concerned about the amount of salt they dump on the roads that's what's polluting the aquifer how are my houses polluting so a whole bunch of things there yeah what i maybe what we can do good points and i don't want to yeah i, I don't want to discount them but maybe what i want to do is disentangle the, the, these two different parts of the conversation sure so one if we just focus for the time being on the map, yep. there's the map and then there's the bylaws. I think most of your comments relate to 
wording in the bylaws about what is or is not permitted within right. these different zones. What what the science behind laying all this out, how, how current is that? So what I understand, um, and I, you know, and this is essentially secondhand information, yep. is that the zone two yep. is defined by the state. Sure. By law, and the boundaries of the zone two are delineated by the state and okay. provided to the operators of, you know. And that's current, right? right. And that's, that's not, current. That's not something from 1965. That's current. Is not, I mean, I don't know that these boundaries are regularly updated. The building commissioner East Hampton made a point to me. She said a lot of flood plain and stuff like that. She's like, they're going off maps that are 40 years old and they just keep reiterating and regurgitating these maps and it's never been updated so i think i think jd and i may have this wrong we should probably check with the water commissioners but i think these are based on the hydrological studies that were done when the aquifer overlay was first passed so it was probably 30 years ago but is that we were told it would cost about a million dollars i think to do a new one okay i mean it, it's it is it's an enormous expense that that may oh, not be the right I figure, understand. But, but it's a budget busting expense to to do new hydrological surveys. So these these were based on on the original ones when the aquifer overlay was first passed. Right. And Judy, when it was passed 30 years ago for that, houses polluted a horrible amount. We polluted everywhere. Now we don't. Um Again, the state requires these. Okay. Um, based now, it may be that the the inputs for the hydrological survey have changed, which is what you're saying. Yeah. But we still have to do another one. Yeah. So the state doesn't update this regularly. We have to do undertake this on our own. I gather we would have to do it, but I, that was the impression I had from the discussions. That's my understanding as well. Okay. And I also don't know, I think th this is one of those things, especially as a sit, you know, an unpaid volunteer board where there's seemingly limitless opportunity to, to dig in and, and try to understand all the ins and outs here. For example, mm -hmm. if this, the state requires these zone twos and the state performs the studies and does the delineations. Mm -hmm but I don't know what the state mandates in terms of what protections local zoning must impose within a zone. Two. Okay, so so we have the zone, the, the back of a protection area, but we, we are saying what the zoning is in there. We are, but I, again, I wanna be careful and say, I wasn't around when the zoning bylaw was created. I don't know what was behind the decisions about setbacks and lot coverages and all of that. And I don't know what was a citizen choice in Waitley versus mandates from the state associated with these zones. Okay, so I agree with the aquifer protection maps as drawn. I agree with that. I don't agree with the zoning of it, but I agree with the, the that. Now, I will point out, thank you. I will point out that my understanding of zone three is rather different than zone two. And no, I, I mean, I, I, I mean more, I, I agree with everything that you've shown about the actual protection districts and the boundaries and stuff. I don't agree that having an extra 50 feet of frontage protects the aquifer anymore. So let's get to that in time. Okay. Okay. Um, what I want to point out about the zone two, zone three boundaries, and I have not been able to get solid, reliable information, um, or at least it's not clear to me. I have been told variously that the delineation of, that zone three is not required by the state. Zone two is required by the state. And I'm, I have been told that many municipalities do not have a zone three, okay? Uh, I've been told that our zone three here was delineated by Franklin Regional Council of Government staff. 
not by hydrological studies, but I've also been told that it was delineated by hydrological studies. So I don't know what to believe at this moment about the delineation of the boundary of zone three. All I know is that before the water district public, before the water district became a public water supply, these zones that you see here were the zones in effect at that time. And so, and these, and it was the water department's recommendation that we, the planning board, move through the process of reverting the boundaries to the original boundary shown here for just the water department. Okay, is that clear to everybody? I'm not proposing digging into the science behind the zone three. I'm not proposing to try to do more studies to figure out whether that's the right <clears throat> boundaries of zone three or whether we should even have a zone three. It's just like, this is the way it was before the water district was added. Now we've taken out the water district and we're going back to the pre-water district protection boundaries on this map. Okay. That makes sense. All right. Um, I will say that it came up and I'm curious, maybe Judy might have a response to this. Again, I wonder. So Brian Domino, our town administrator in reviewing and commenting on this map, asked what seemed like a very interesting and valid question, which is, well, how would a property owner know where their lot stands with respect to these boundaries? What's the, and it would seem like this would be a building inspector decision. Um, it's not, I mean, these are polygon lines on a map. There's a, a, a GIS map that is the basis for drawing these boundaries. But well, I've asked the question of the GIS specialist and the building inspector, if a property owner tried to say my land is or is not within this zone, how would they go about adjudicating that? And I have yet to receive an answer and I'm gonna to continue to follow up until I do. Well, I can give a, a practical answer, maybe not a definitive legal one. Um, I think you have mentioned and we have intention of putting this map up on the, as a layer on the assessor's maps once it's approved. So that would give the property owner a rough idea of where, where their parcel falls. And, and the building inspector, if they want a definitive idea, then they would have to get an engineering. They would probably need a land survey. And that's what these people are paid to do. And I don't think that's really much different than interpreting AGRA's where Agra is one and Agra is two start because you, you actually, to do it right, you need to know where the town way is and, and you, need a, you need an engineering drawing. So I, I think the practic as a practical matter, it's not, well, it's not all that different. Yeah. Well, that's helpful. Um, it, and there is language in the bylaw that basically says that if any portion of a parcel falls within these zones, then the parcel in its entirety must be treated as if it's within the zone, the protection zone. Um, so even if a tiny corner of your parcel is um, in the zone, so some property owners may have care. So there's some kind of process, but this would be one of those conversations. I don't know that this has come up. I was surprised that Brian asked the question. Brian is a- I thought I thought he was in, implying that we should put parcels on the map. That was, I don't that know was how we would that do question. that. And, and as you know, as you well know, given we've just done an ANR, 
parcels and parcel numbers are going to change over time. Even uh -huh. if we enumerate no, I, I had a, I thought that, that was the import of his question. I, I didn't see a practical way of doing that. Do you? Okay, fine. I mean, I don't know how you would go along these boundaries and enumerate all the parcels in a way that. No, would... I think he was saying for. I th thought he. I thought he was saying we should put a parcel layer on the map, the whole map. I will go back and clarify that with Brian. Um, I, that could be total fantasy, but that's that's the way I read his question. And on that point, by the way, I have been periodically following up with the assessor's office about the zoning, uh, this, the zoning layers on the online map. And I'm told that they're working on it, but for some reason it still hasn't been added. So I'm continuing to follow up on that. Okay, so, so that's the map. And I think the- so Another think we, comment on the map. Yeah, please, Judy. I think the font he chose with the the um, outline and the and the white middle on the on the letters, for so much of it makes the street names impossible to read. I, oh, I think it on the street names. The street names are very difficult, and I'm not sure. If even AR one and two and three, I I it seems the. Uh, overly fancy and not not very productive font okay. choice. So style. I guess it's a style rather than a font. So I think I think But the, especially um, when you try to read the street names. The it looks like the his font choice for the proposed new map and the approved map are the same. That doesn't mean we have to, if we've had, so I can just have them. I, I agree that the, the word, the labeling of the roads is very hard to read. And I think if it were just black letters, that would be fine. Yeah, be much better. And um, the AR, AR2 markers. They're not as bad, but. They're not as bad. Okay. So we're going to get we're going to, I'm going to give feedback to the GIS specialist about the zone ones, as we said, remove all zone hatching outside of Waitley, remove all um, zone ones depicted outside of Waitley and those in West Waitley that don't relate to the water department. I think those are the changes to the map. So I'll take those back because we're we will eventually and clearly not uh, fairly soon. That don't relate to the zoning. Yeah, that don't relate to the zoning, right? Well, the 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 zone one is depicted in West way, Waitley the, don't to relate to our zoning, do they? They don't have to no. do with our public water supply. No. Right. But the if. Sarah's right, the well in Hatfield does relate to the water department, but it doesn't relate to our zoning. Yeah, so the criteria is it relates to our zoning. So I think I understand that. So that just so we're clear on the, the effect that the zone ones in West Waitley will go away, the zone ones in Hatfield and the cross hatching in Hatfield will go away. And the cross hatching for zone two um, in Deerfield will go away as well. Are, Should are we zone three be a different this? color? Oh, not green? Yeah, Brian, Brian commented on that. Mm -hmm. It's hard to tell where it overlaps, particularly in that, um, is that the Swamp Road, Chestnut uh, Plain, Christian Lane. Okay. Area. Yeah. All right. That was another piece of feedback. Change the coloring of Zone 3. Excuse me, but are, did we wind up saying remove all Zone 1s 
that don't relate to Waitley zoning, whether they're in Waitley or outside of Waitley? Yes. It just think depends that's what on the said. zoning. Thank you. And my interpretation of that is that zone ones that relate to water supplies that are not part of Waitley, like the Northampton water supply, are zoning because they're not affected by our zoning, those are removed as well. Okay. I couldn't tell on the scale, size scale here, are, are we comfortable that the zone one is, is a accurate depiction of that area? Because we'd always thought it was too small to show before. It looks quite large there. Well, it is. Uh, this, if you compare 400 feet for Agres one, yeah. probably fine. I guess if Agres one is 400 feet back from. I would be able to confirm that if I could see this on the online map, but I will check that with the GIS specialist. He had yeah. the he had the guidance. It's true that it. The diameter, it's a 400 foot radius, right? Not diameter. If you include the, the, the red center, it, well, I guess the question is, does it go, does it go to the outer boundary or just the red dot? Because I'm looking like the zone ones, if you look at say Egypt Road, and since AR1 is 400 feet back, and you see that it's, if you look at the zone, the AR1 zone on either side of Egypt Road, you get a sense of what about 800 feet is, 400 yeah. feet on either side of the road. And that looks about the size of the, the circle. Yeah, well, that's what I was trying to say, but I maybe just, just check. Okay, happy to check. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing the map. Anne, did you have any questions or comments? I don't need to, you're a member of the public, right to comment. Yeah, thank you. No, um, not really. This was interesting. I think my main purpose for sitting in on this actually was to make sure the water supply is protected and not just the water district supply, but there's a lot of private wells. That's my right. selfish interest coming down the mountain there. So I just want to make sure, you know, <laughs> that that wasn't going away for some yeah. reason. So, so the truth, of course, is we are not, by zoning, doing anything to protect private water supplies. I understand, but the water supply goes underground from areas that are over here and end up over here. So if you were saying, oh, I'm taking zone three and no pro protection for water over there, well, something that seeps into the ground over there is going to come into my well. So right. that's all. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Okay, right. thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to bow out, I think, but I appreciate okay. your, your had enough uh, fun for one night. I get it. <laughs> it was right. fun. Appreciate right. it. Thanks, Sam. Bye bye. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing this map. Oh, there was a chat message, Sarah. Sylvie had the oh, leave. That was Sylvie. Okay, very good. All right, so I'm stopping sharing the map, and what I want to do now is share um, proposed bylaw revisions, though this doesn't account for comments that JD has made tonight. So I've made, and we should have that discussion, but I'll just say I've made very targeted changes to the Aquifer Protection District bylaw to go along with this proposed new map. So what I'm setting this up for is a public hearing with where we, do a hearing on the map, and we do a hearing on these changes to the Aquifer Protection District. All right, so I want to just review those with all of you, uh, and then we can have a discussion as, you know, whether now is the right time to think about broader changes to the to the bylaw. But right now, these are very targeted. So the first change is to eliminate uh, a reference to the water district that has was kept in there. In fact, this sentence 
leaving in the reference to the Waitley Water District's um, swap report. That was what at least let us keep the delineations on the map related to the water district, even though it was abandoned. So now that we're going to change the delineations of the zones, we can remove this wording that in our current bylaw that refers to the water district. Grant, um, I got a little lost on what we're referring to. You're you're looking at the actual bylaw now. Could you? I'm looking that... at the actual bylaw. And so could now... you give me a, a section on that? Yeah, it's uh, and I've sent around the document. It's section. It's bylaw section one seventy one dash twenty eight dot four. Part C is what we're looking at right now. Okay. So I'm just striking out some unnecessary words, eliminating the reference to the water district. So far, so good. The next change, it seemed like we, um, whereas after having the new zoning map approved, we never changed this part of the aquifer protection bylaw to refer to the, the May 2023 map. So now I'm proposing that we will modify this portion of the bylaw, the aquifer map, to now be clear with whatever date we select for the new map. And I'm striking out this text, which refers, which was left in. We apparently forgot to remove that last May. No, we deliberately left it in Did because we? we weren't changing the map. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. You're absolutely right. But now we're, we can strike that text out. So what would have to happen is once we agree on a map and we put it, have a date put into it that we take to town meeting, then this bylaw text would be updated to have the correct map date. And I think that's the only two changes that were needed. We okay with those. that? What was that Judy? Those. Okay. So Judy moves that we um, accept these changes. Second it. Okay. JD has seconded it. Um, any other discussion before we vote? Sarah, are you good? I think this is pretty cut and dry. All right, roll call vote, top to bottom. Sarah? Yes. JD? Yes. Judy? Yes. Grant is yes. OK, so we've approved these changes uh, to the zoning, to the aquifer protection bylaw. All right. Um, and oh, should we? Oh, and I guess we shouldn't yet move to approve the map because it's got to go through another yeah. set of revisions. Okay. All right. With um, regard to JD's comments about for other revisions to the district, I think it makes a lot of sense to re-examine it. But I think it's a big job and should have input from people other than the planning board, like the water department, um, conservation commission maybe um perhaps board of health um yeah. and so maybe create a study committee that would look at it for the purpose of having a bylaw ready for the annual town meeting in 2025 yeah i think this is definitely a situation of picking our battles given our available time and resources. Judy really did me did us all a service by kind of reminding us that if annual town meetings come well if assuming it's coming up on its regular April schedule, whatever we want to get done for this annual town meeting has to be moved along fairly quickly at this point. Um, and so we'll revisit that before tonight's meeting is over. I think I'm ready to move off of the aquifer protection discussion to allow time for discussion of what Judy proposed related to um, affordable housing. We good to move on? Okay. 
Very good. All right, so let me get set up to screen share. So Judy, Judy. Uh, sorry. Um, While you're setting this up for JD's benefit, um, when when the planning board reviewed the housing production plan, um, the housing committee asked us to prioritize changes that would be helpful for affordable housing. And yep. at the October meeting, which unfortunately I don't think Grant attended, um, we, we talked about it and we decided that given the limited amount of time available, we'd concentrate on ones that we thought were doable within the time and that probably had a fairly good chance of being passed. Um, and in coming up with that latter sentence, I, you know, some of these, some of the other proposals are, are more sweeping and I think would require a major education effort for the town about what the current housing situation is and what affordable really means and a lot of other things that um, hasn't happened yet. And it doesn't look like it's, I don't think there's time for it to happen before town meeting anyway. So, so we picked these two areas to, to focus on um, and so that what I call the community housing bylaw is basically um, kind of the reason I think it would pass is because pretty much the state law allows this anyway. Um, but what this would what this is intended to do is to allow certain provisions of the bylaws to be relaxed as long as there's a special permit and site plan review. Mm -hmm. So it gives the developers a lot of what most of what they get under a 40B, they don't have to go to the expense and hassle of filing a 40B. They do have to get a special permit. And that's the concept. Now, I just kind of, well, um, that would be allowed for, in exchange for a public good. The public good here is, is that you have to have a permanent housing covenant. And I chose the same same percentage as 40B that it would have to apply to 25% of the units. Um, and I just, to make definitions easy, I just said that it, it should be um, a covenant that meets the requirements of the subsidized housing inventory, which is standard. Um, and then B would waive the dimensional dimensional requirements, um, and um, and I tried to I think setbacks, especially from side setbacks, get to be fairly critical. Um, so I included a provision that the reducing the size of setbacks is discouraged. Um, Again, to be consistent with 40B, um, one place where 40B is not exempt from local zoning is for safety, health, and environmental reasons. And I am pretty sure that it would be very hard to get a 40B in over the Aquifer Protection Overlay District. And I think there would be a fairish amount of opposition in town for doing that. Um, again, without a education limit. Um, I limited it to 12 units because I think that is an appropriate scale for Waitley. Um, also, I think anything much bigger than that would have difficulty passing. Um, four dwelling units in a structure if you want, um, that's basically it. Okay. 
JD, from a builder's perspective, what does this do? I did my homework. I read the housing production plan and I spoke with three building officials and all the builders in town and some realtors. And once we go over a two family dwelling, it's a, it's commercial basically. Sprinkler systems, huge septic systems, allowing 12 units. I don't know that it would fit anywhere in town and meet the requirements of Title V. Um, and then the housing production plan, it's almost like a quasi subsidized, they're, they're advocating for hiring a coordinator to manage taking public and private funds to develop property to keep it affordable. Um, I think there's so much oversight from a capitalist perspective, the builder is going to build what, or the developer is going to build what maximizes their investment and bypass what the, what the, the town wants. And as I understand from this 40B, it could be wrong, but the town, um, if they don't meet certain targets for affordable housing, people can petition a, a special permit for this, a comprehensive permit to, to put in whatever they want because the town doesn't meet the well, goal. That's the, that's the 40B. That's yeah, that's 40B. the 40B, right. So in implementing this, I just don't see that. I don't know that there's no, the lack of public transportation. I, I don't see a 12 unit building going in. I just don't no, see No, I it. think you're probably right. I didn't want to, I started at eight. I, my guess is that by and large, this would be used on much smaller lots. The instigation for it actually is um, Catherine Wolkowitz called me about a woman who has a non-buildable lot now. It's mm -hmm. too small. And she wanted to, she would be willing to put in an affordable unit if she could also get a unit for herself. And yep. I thought, well, if it were smaller, you could probably put a, you know, if you could relax the, the acreage size you could probably put two units on, you know, something that looks like a house with a barn attachment or something and have, have an affordable unit and a regular unit. I, I, I see this operating on, on two, three, four unit situations. Yeah. I mean, uh, Walter Thayer has, uh, Richard Thayer has a 10 unit in Hatfield that works great. He is... So they, they, they are out there. Um, so I spoke with Jim Hawkins and he said that he's have been asked this question for all of the towns in FCCIP. All of the planning boards are reaching out to him. He says, you're not the only one that's asking me. Um, his comments were lot sizes are too big, frontages are too big, setbacks are too big. We can, we can, we can have more infill housing with with, with uh, smaller required dimensions. That's what he says. For more housing, you're going to see that. He said Waitley is the only town in FCCIP that requires a special permit for um, a two-family. Every other town is allowed by right except Waitley. Um, the Hadley building inspector told me to be very careful with promoting flag lots because you have problems with people creating a flag lot and subdividing it off and selling parcels he said it's very difficult um the cluster development you talked about before that's more practical or a common drive that's more practical than creating flag lots mm -hmm. now they got in trouble with it the east hampton building commissioner talked the same thing setbacks um densities again not so much allowing flag lots but more common driveways and then talking with other builders they all kind of echoed the same points make it easier to create accessory dwelling units make existing homes two families um letting build on smaller parcels those are all going to increase the housing supply in Waitley but it doesn't solve the affordable issue because that's just letting people in Waitley stay in Waitley it's not creating rental housing or condos and unless Someone's trying to put in a large scale, like they did the base amount Sugarloaf, put in a large scale uh, section of duplexes and you can um, restrict them to affordable units. 
I, so. I guess, um, are you saying you don't think this is worth doing? No, I do. I mean, it's all here, but I don't know that anyone's going to do it. I don't know that anyone's going to invest the money to do this with the land needed and what we would need for septic systems and the like. Um, I, I don't see that. I don't see anyone going into business with the town to develop affordable housing right now. I don't, I don't see it. There's way too much oversight. It's going to be easier on the private scale, but that's not going to solve the problem of making our affordable housing. Well, I, this wasn't intended to, to, this is, this is a, a step. This was intended yeah. to be the first baby step towards, towards getting someplace so that we actually start to do something because if we don't. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. No, so, I, 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 similar, I do. Yeah. Similar to Judy's comment. So I'm just trying to make sure JD, that whether I'm hearing that you don't see this change as changing the game in any meaningful way, or it is a, a worthwhile step. Because again, are we going to are we going to go forward with this? Are we going to have a public hearing on that? You know, right now, do we deal with this, possibly tweak it, do a public hearing in what March? And then get it into public, get it into the town meeting. Is it is it worth it, or do we need to have a longer, more time consuming conversation, and and think about having a solid plan by annual town meeting of twenty twenty five? I I don't have a full answer on that, Brant. I think this is a good step, but part of that housing production plan was really trying to. The emphasis was on affordable housing. Yeah. And by doing that, it's deed restrictions and um, even the town owning the land, but leasing, letting the buildings go on it and they're leasing the buildings and um, you're becoming a housing authority. And Waitley doesn't have a, if Waitley wants to have affordable housing, really they're gonna have to create a housing authority and go down that route to do it yeah. like Hatfield does. Um, I don't see a private investment in, in creating that in town financially, especially with what things cost right now. Yeah. It's got to be subsidized somehow, and we have some money in CPA funds for it, but not nearly enough to do it. Not nearly. So if the town wants to go down that road and they want to invest in affordable housing, the mail property or, or somewhere. Well, I, I think not, everybody does. I don't here. think anybody's ready to do it yet. So what... Yeah. You know, maybe what we ought to be working on instead of this is getting duplexes by. Yeah, there's, there's the two issues here. The one issue is creating affordable housing for people. Yeah. We really think it's going to be of a, like, like I said, of, of a housing, a Whitley Housing Authority that's going to invest in that, maybe with the grant money or developers. And then well, I'm hoping the other issue is creating more density in town. and that's easing zoning setbacks and making it easier to create accessory apartments and ADUs and, and two this families. Is, this is intended to be a, a start in that direction and it might produce yeah. two, three, four units. It's not gonna solve the problem. No, it's not. But at least, but at least it's a start. I agree. I agree. Okay. Um. I, I find myself so torn in multiple dimensions, especially since it's 10 of, you know, 10 of seven, and I want to spend much more time on this. We could um, spend three days on this. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'd like to be, uh, so I'm torn because on the one hand, I feel this, this desire and, 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 and pressure and pressure to to do something it's like fix it but do something that, um i'd like to be working much more in concert and collaboratively with the housing committee and i shared this with the chair and she has you know Grant, the housing committee hasn't met since September. I know, I know. I, 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 I don't see how we can work with them if right. they don't meet. I will this tell you, I, I, I have been meeting, but I'll, I'll also tell you, not apropos of this, but um, I've gotten all kinds of new feedback from the ZBA and others that 
our initial conclusion about ADUs being not very, um, you know, in demand. Um, and I, I mean, I've had feedback from the ZBA, and I think I've shared this with all of you, suggesting that we could be make productive changes to our ADUs and follow the HPP recommendations about ADUs, including allowing them by right, increasing the uh, uh, square footage and so forth, which is a, another longer conversation we can have by this year's town meeting. Okay, so so I'm sensing nobody wants to go through with this now and, and the timing isn't right, so maybe we should move on. God. <laughs> That's hard because I really, we need to start making these steps. Yeah, I'm with Sarah on that. I um, mean, these were our initial, our low hanging fruit are pretty easy and starting to get the town ready to start thinking about this on a bigger basis of what we need to do. Um, I'm so almost, almost preps us. You know, I, I, I hope and wish and intend to try to help work with the housing commission that has been starting to meet roughly monthly um, to do this educational campaign and inform, you know, engage Waitley citizens around this topic. There's a part of me that wants, Judy, because you've done this work, I think there's great thinking here. Um, no, I, I, I won't be hurt. I won't be hurt. I, I know you wouldn't be hurt. Um, I know you, <laughs> but I'm almost inclined to 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 move forward with this for this year's town meeting, if only to start driving the conversation. Even if for some reason this if this got approved at town meeting, I think it would be a step. I'm not yet convinced that much would change by adding this. I haven't had enough time to digest it. I think there's more need for discussion about this, but rather than just tabling it, I'm inclined to move forward, do the public hearing and recommend it for this year's town meeting and see what happens. There will be a discussion at town meeting. We will absolutely have to get up proactively in front of voters. Well, I think that the out timing outline I, I suggested was that we hold our regular Jan end of January meeting and we could, I, I think I used the word polish, but you know, yes. um, refine or work, do further work. Yeah on this um, and then and in the meantime share it with you know maybe get the housing committee to comment um, certainly get somebody from you know would be interesting to have Brian's comments obviously um, and maybe I don't know Megan Rhodes or somebody who who worked with the housing production plan um, so let's agree to do that. Let me ask you, there was a second proposal about the cluster um, cluster development bylaw. In the yeah. interest of time and wanting to do something about approval of minutes, um, I mean, we can stay on a little bit later tonight, but I'm wondering how you feel about trying to have that. I can summarize the cluster bylaw thing very quickly. Um, when when the, we discussed it with the housing production plan, we the suggestion was to look at the incentives in the bylaw. When Brandt asked last time, what were the impediments to doing this? I said, well, and it was only later that I thought, well, wait a minute, this growth control provision in the bylaws, I don't think any builder would be hindered by the, any builder capable of building a big um, big development would know about the court case and know that it wasn't binding. <laughs> but I'm not sure a lot owner would. And it certainly doesn't help. 
So that could come out. And then um, I thought, well, wait a minute here. And this isn't a bylaw matter. It doesn't have to go to town meeting. But our subdivision regulations contain all this, these expensive provisions for subdivisions that we don't even want. You know, wide, yep. wide roads, street lights, sidewalks, storm drains. Um, and I think those might be a real deterrent. So I, I think you could get rid of the growth control law very easily by saying, look, we can't enforce it anyway. Um, it yeah. has no teeth. Uh, the courts have overruled it, period. Yeah. And then the subdivision one we can do on our own. Um, all we have to do is hold a public hearing. I think if we just tackle the things that are expensive in there, as opposed to trying to do a whole a whole systematic review of the subdivision bylaw, which yeah. is a big, big job. But if we just focus on the things that might be hindering <laughs> <clears throat> and I agree. The, the sort of smart growth things we could do that fairly efficiently so that's that's that do we need if we made changes to the subdivision regulations would we need to get that approved at a town meeting no no okay that's the difference between a regulation and a bylaw a regulation right. just just needs a public hearing so i'd like there to I'd like to, outside of this meeting, have a little back and forth with you, Judy, just about strategy, because I'm starting to feel pressed for time, right? Between now and, mm -hmm. and an April town sure. meeting. So I think yep. we absolutely need to that do was, the aquifer. That was the intent of my email to make you And, and I'm so good. grateful you lit a fire underneath us for that. Um, and so I want to think about this a little bit more. Um, I think we've already agreed and before we wrap up. Uh, I do need to, I, I do feel pressed to just extend our meeting time just to do some approval of minutes. I'd like to close on this, agree that we're going to continue this. We're gonna have our meeting at the end of January on January 31st and we'll, and we'll continue our discussions about these proposals for related to affordable housing. Okay, thank you, Judy. All right. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do some approval of minutes. Grant, uh, Sarah, I think yes. we also really need to address um, the center school appointment of a person just to get that on record and get that to Brian. That one seems, I think is pretty timely. Is my oh, opinion. oh, oh, yes. I um, So I told, so Brian asked, the planning board what, that two proposals for the center school have been received. There's a review committee being formed. They want somebody from the planning board to be on that committee. Um, I responded, Brian, saying that, well, I will ask my colleagues and if no one steps forward, I will do it. So Judy felt that JD would be perfect. Um, so it still stands. So the question is, is either Sarah, well, is any, are any of you three more passionate about being involved in that review? Otherwise I will do it as a board chair. I'll do it, Brent. I mean, Judy's put a lot of time into the, all this other stuff. I can step up and do that. Excuse that me, would be, just, just for the minutes, what is it that needs to be done? So there is a review committee being formed to review proposals for purchasing and renovating the center school. I think mm -hmm. I got that right. Thank you. And so the town is going to evaluate those proposals and they're seeking representatives from key boards and committees to be involved. It's so my understanding that the select them make the decision. We're just giving them advice. That's Come. my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have I think it's like outdoors. developing a scoring system and okay. evaluating. And it seemed like there was just going to be one, one or two meetings. It's not a, a long standing commitment. I'm going to Florida for school vacation in February, but otherwise I'm available. So I All think right. he's, I think they want to get us going quickly. Okay. All right. I will, um, 
Thank you, JJ. JJ to Brian. With you. Thank Good you. Catch, thank sir. you. So I will convey that information to Brian. Okay. So let's see if we can quickly get through um, approval of outstanding minutes. I can't vote on those, right? Because I wasn't a member. You were also on the other side of some of them. I could have been. <laughs> yeah, you were definitely one of but them. But you were, you were, yeah. Yeah, so I think it, we still have a quorum of voters with yep. three of us. We um, never got to the Simmers letter slide either. The Judy. I know, I know. It's, it's been a busy night for us. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, uh, let me simply say, well, I, I will get, uh, let's just do the, we'll just do the meeting minutes. Okay. So I'm going to uh, share, what did I get? So I'm for thinking. for May, I think for May 17, give me one second to share. So planning board minutes, from May 17. Um, they're in draft. I think I made a few corrections in Word with track changes. I don't believe I saw any additional corrections from Judy on the May 17 minutes, but they were very short. No, I, I, I thought it was fine with your corrections. Okay, very good. The same with the 24th. So these were minor changes. So I'm going to, as moderator, I feel I shouldn't be making motions. So do I hear a motion? Sarah's moving. I will make a motion to approve the May, May 17th with amendments. With a, Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Judy, might you be seconding that? A second. Okay. Roll call vote on the motion. Sarah, I. Judy, I only see the top of your head, Judy. Are you trying to hide oh. from us? <laughs> like. Okay. And I vote I. So the May 17 minutes are approved as amended. Uh, and I know I sent those around. Awesome. Let's move to uh, May. 31st, and again, I'm going to screen share. I don't believe I saw any additional changes from Judy. I thought they were fine with your changes. Okay. I'll put a forward a motion to accept the May 31st minutes as amended. Second. All right, uh, motion made and approved. So, uh, roll call, Sarah. Yes. I, Judy. I. And I, for me, yay. All right, and then moving on from there, uh, we have June 14, where only Judy made changes, and I'm about to screen share. Those came out. All right, so I'm screen sharing those. I did review them. Um, I mean, I think adoption here is misspelled. So I'm correcting that live. Yeah, what was that? Never mind. <laughs> um, for which, oh, I'm going to, Judy, you asked whether this comment about Waitley receiving an additional state grant. Um, I believe that's a true statement, but I'm going to recommend we just strike that from the minutes as being not necessary in our minutes. So I'm going to just suggest we delete that. Um, and we're going to delete that thread. 
this was correct. Um, I agree with Judy's comment about this first bullet point, and I'm just, I would recommend we just strike it. Agreed. Okay. Delete that. And again, I will make sure, whoop, that went too far. Let's say more CPA funds and housing trust funds available. More CPA, you know, the town has more CAP funds and or more CPA and housing trust. Would it like be this? Okay. Take out fun take out funds after CPA. CPA and have very good. This looks good to me. All right. Um, so in this case, I see Sarah, you're going to make that motion. I will. All right. I'll and make I, will motion second, to... I will second since, well, no, Judy should second. Second. All right. All right. Um, roll call. Yes. Sarah, I, Judy. I, I, and I am I as well on June 14. Brent, would you please email me the, the latest update with this? The yeah, correct, that's that what I'm just going now. Up. Right now, I'm saving a copy. We just did June 14, JM Rev 2. So I'm going to save. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for doing those. Oh, you did a good job. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And we're not done yet. I know you're thinking we're done. Um, we're, there's one, I think, one more. Uh, so uh, October is outstanding. I will just simply say I did November because I was using it as an, a, a way to learn about, uh, I had a personal reason to learn about uh, using chat GPT. Um, <laughs> so now let me screen share this last set of minutes for November 29th. This is as modified by, was written by me and is modified by Judy. Uh, and I think JD gets to vote on this because you were a member in November. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Um, oh, the John Baronis meeting. Yep. Yes, the John Baronis meeting. Um, Judy recommended striking this particular bullet and i'm going to respectfully disagree i think judy makes an absolutely valid point that it's not necessary and something we all should all know it makes already. this look stupid grant i didn't want to put that in writing say that one more time i think it makes us look stupid that Do you, you? Have to remind well i spent many hours okay, being fine. told that i could do this which is wrong, and I and I want this. You know, I, I'm no prepared to. No I objection. want this on the record. <laughs> I want okay. this on the record. Okay. All your other changes, I I totally support. Um, they made it uh, you know much shorter, simpler, and sweeter. So I um, you're gonna have to talk to Chat GPT about condensing. Well, I think you should be impressed with how well ChatGPT took a very long discussion. No, I'm kidding. And got it down to two paragraphs. And you brought human intelligence to do it an even better job. So I think these minutes of, and you also, I think I appreciated the fact you added the documents discussed at the meeting and on file, which I overlooked when I did the write-up. So I would be, I'm I, will handle, I will handle the cleanup of the June, I'm sorry, the November, what are we looking at? November 29th minute. So this is not on Mary. I wrote them, Judy edited them. 
So if we have a vote to approve as amended, I, move we I will take that action. Amended. Okay, so the motion has been made. Judy, uh, Sarah, are you possibly seconding it? Um, I will second that. All right, uh, so we now can have a vote that includes JD. Starting from the top is Sarah. Yes. JD. Yes. Judy. Yes. And I am voting yes. Okay. So all of those minutes are approved. So just a few last things before we wrap up for the night. Number one, we're going to have our regular planning board meeting at the end of January. So two meetings in January. So make sure you're not assuming you're getting off till end of February. That's number one. Um, number two, regarding the Simmers Creamy letter. That letter in its final form, as I sent it around to all of you, is now sitting in that file, in that it's been signed, it's being held by the town clerk to, to mail upon my direction. So we have a last chance, if anyone has any second thoughts or feels it needs to be changed. This is not, we don't need to vote on this, but we've already voted to send this letter. So I will tell the town clerk by email to go ahead and send that letter. Okay. Um, I will just point out for the record, we did receive those two annual reports from NexAmp about their solar facilities. I they seem to meet the requirements, though they seem to be very uh, short on detail based on what I thought might have been the intent of the bylaw, but I don't know that we'll have this discussion tonight. Simply put it out there, and if we want to have a discussion about this, um, those reports and their content or whatever, then I recommend anyone who'd like to have that conversation, send me an email so we would put it on our agenda for the end of January, okay? Uh, we still have, um, I'm going to again kick this can down and somehow get this higher on our agenda for next time. We now have um, awards we'd like to give out to Don Sluter, to Peggy McDonald, Peggy Sloan, Sloan. Sloan. Peggy Sloan and Tom Litwin for <clears throat> various service of the planning board. I have a template. I have a willing wife who's ready to go pick out nice frames and do the framing. We have approval to use planning board funds to do this. Uh, no conflict of interests, none of this. I've cleared it all. We, we're, we're good to go as long as we approve doing it. Let's do it. Sarah's let's do it. Agreed. No, Peg, Peggy is Peggy. Peggy. Yeah. Peggy Sloan. And the only outstanding issues are we know where Tom lives so we can deliver an award to Tom. Don't we know where Tom lives? You made a face, Sarah. No, I'm just thinking I have no idea where Dawn is. That is, Judy was looking into that. Adelia, Adelia has Dawn's address, but. His new address. Yeah. Okay. Because we will need to get this to Don, I, you know, I will do my best to, once I have an actual plaque certificate to, to deliver, I will try to deliver these in person. But if I can't, I will need an address. I, I will need a place to, to go. All right. Well, I owe Peggy a lunch and I'd be happy to take it to Peggy over this lunch I owe her. Okay, all right. So I will work with my wonderful wife to get these prepared um, for Tom Litwin. And it's Tom, not Thomas. It's Don Sluter and it's Peggy Sloan. And we'll use the same template for each. And I'll circulate those drafts um, so you see them before they get turned into framed things. All right, so you'll see the, the documents coming by you now. Um, and by golly, I think I've covered everything that we needed to cover. So, um, 
there could be a motion to adjourn unless somebody has other things that is on their mind. I'll move. Okay, second. Judy, I think got the motion. Sarah got the second. We don't have to vote on this. We're adjourning at 7.18 p.m. Thank you for the extra 18 minutes of your time and service to Waitley. I look forward to seeing you on Zoom again. Uh, oh, there is one more thing, um, even though we're adjourned. I am interviewing middle of this month, a candidate for the planning board. And I'm corresponding with another person recommended by Nat Fortune, but I'm not sure that person is <laughs> able to take on the time commitments. Um, but I do have one mm -hmm. um, viable, seemingly viable and interested candidate. So I will have more news, I hope, to fill the open position um, by our next meeting. Okay. Thank you. Have a good rest of your night. We'll be in touch. Thank you all. Good, good night. night. Good night. Bye now.